Two and a Half Admins, episode 123. I'm Joe. I'm Jim. And I'm Alan. And here we are again. And this is the last episode of the year, so we thought we'd do something of a year in review, but instead of kind of going month by month, I thought we'd do a couple of topics. The first one is AI and machine learning. It really seems to have been the year of that with all the art generation stuff and the image generation stuff, chat GPT. It just seems to have absolutely exploded this year. Yeah, all of that plus the deep fakes. It's uh, really going to make the world a bit of an interesting place. Because, you know, it's been so boring up until now. <laughs> Honestly, at this point, I'm starting to think that deep fake capability via GANs is not going to be as big a deal as I originally thought it was. Because I feel like what we've really learned over the past several years is that humans at scale are stupider than we ever really believed to begin with. And they're so willing to believe completely obvious fakes that I'm just, I'm not real sure how far a more believable fake really moves the needle. You know, you have people who were worried about authenticity and doing the bare minimum of research to figure out if something is real or not. And you have people that don't. And I said it already. I'm just, I'm starting to wonder if the extra fake authenticity really makes that big of a difference. Yeah, it kind of brings back to like the idea with the fishing and stuff. It's like they don't try very hard because they don't want to catch the people that would actually check to see if something was real. Yeah. Ultimately, you know, the way forward with the deep fake problem, it's going to make it harder to trust, uh, you know, random individual photo, particularly anonymously taken, dubious source. But... Any real reporting from somebody who takes reporting vaguely seriously, basically you're going to treat it like, well, like like Microsoft treats code now. You know, your your video clips are going to be signed. And the reason that you'll trust them is because, you know, this video was was signed by a trustworthy individual or organization who you were aware of and who you believe, you know, their word that they're not going to fake the thing. And part of the way that you build that trust in that person or organization is in them doing that and well, not to go too blue on the Christmas episode, but not fucking it up for a while. <laughs> it's funny that both of you have gone straight for the fakes and the negative aspects of this. What about the positive aspects of it? Like ChatGPT being able to be a great teacher of code, for example. I don't know it's a great teacher of code. It does a very good job of making code that looks like it's right, but actually isn't and doesn't do what it's supposed to do. <laughs> Alan hit the nail on the head there. Uh, what what these GANs are really good at doing is producing content that looks believable to a human who doesn't know better. And in some cases, it, the, the things that they produce may be as legitimate as anything else, but the problem is you still need a human expert to weigh in and figure out, you know, is this real or is this not real? Or in the case of something like code, actually try to execute it and see, does it do what it's supposed to do? But again, the problem here, and this is a bigger thing, I think our society is going to be taking a very long time getting right, we have been training people for at least three generations now to believe that computers are completely logical and they don't make mistakes unless they, there were mistakes in the programming they were given. And that is not how AI works. AI is not symbolic formal logic. AI works exactly like your intuition and gut hunches. It's not really very dissectable. You don't know why the AI decided this is a cat and that's a dog. All you know is that it did and you either agree with it or you don't. And when you ask it to start creating things, whether it be a picture of a cat or a picture of a dog or a snippet of code, you don't know if it's going to do it right until you look at it and weigh it and evaluate it and decide, did it do it right or not? And it really depends on being told when it got it wrong to learn. But if we assume that it's right and we don't give it the signal that it was wrong, it's going to continue down the path of, no, that was right. And it get worse and worse and not better and better. And it doesn't understand any of these things in the way that a human understands any of these things. Again, this is something that our society is going to struggle with getting right in their own heads for a long time because, uh, you know, chat GPT can converse with you. And unless you're an expert who knows how to test its weaknesses directly, it can absolutely pass a Turing test, you know, with the typical human being. The typical human is more likely to notice when chat GPT gets something wrong and think of it as a human that got something wrong because it will get it wrong in the same ways that humans do. 
But the better analogy, you know, to the extent that we have any analogies for how AI works or the way that we should think about it, you know, it's a lot like genetically engineered bacteria that we farm to produce some drugs now. You know, does it know that it's making a drug? No, it absolutely does not. It's, you know, bacteria, living bacteria's life that we've engineered to have an output that is convenient for us. But y- you can't think of it like, oh, well, you know, this is a colony of trained chemists. No, man, it's bacteria. And that's the way you have to think about AI. You're talking about something with the general intelligence of a flatworm, actually a bit less than a flatworm, that is nonetheless managing to carry on a conversation with you. You can't map that to the way humans think and communicate. What about the creative aspects of it, though? For example, someone I know asked ChatGPT to write an emo song along with the chords, and then he played the chords and recorded it, and it was a pretty convincing emo song. And he makes mixtapes as well with AI-produced art that looks really cool. And he knows it's AI, and it's just a bit of fun, let's say. But it, it can create something that is pleasing, either to the eye in terms of art or in terms of poetry or whatever. It does have some merit there, and it is going to change things, and it is already changing things in terms of art. I just don't really find that part that controversial. I know that a lot of humans do, but that part I don't. Uh, You ask it to make an emo song, and it made an emo song, and either you like it or you don't. And just because you like it doesn't mean that some other human will like it. Just because you don't like it doesn't mean that some other human won't like it themselves, even though you don't. It's all subjective, so whatever it makes, it's fine, whatever. The controversy there is partly over the issue that it will put artists out of work. Well, you know, this is just... It's back to what automobiles did, the buggy whip industry. Technology changes. The amount of effort it takes to do a thing is reduced by new tools that have been created. Song as old as time. I'm really not that worried about that. The other controversy is people who mistakenly believe that when AI is trained on a data set, it then just copies and pastes pieces of the data set out, rearranged into things. But again, that's a controversy because people don't understand the way it works. That's not what it actually does. I have seen people over and over and over claim again that GAN-generated images are just stitched together pastiches of what was in the data set. People are so intent on believing that, they will continue to argue that's what it does even after you point out, look, we know the data set this model trained on, and the actual model does not have enough information in it to constitute more than roughly one-third of one pixel of each of the individual images in its training data set. It's not copying and pasting things. It doesn't have a memory of the data set. It learns associations from the data set in the same way that an organic brain would. Not in the same way, but in an analogous way, let's say. Depending on how picky you want to get, fine. Again, traditional computer programming is symbolic logic. It works roughly the way that you express your thoughts to another person. You know, symbolic logic in traditional computer programming is like you getting up in front of the class and showing your work on the blackboard. The way AI works is when the teacher asked the same question in math class and the answer just popped into your head and you said it and you were right, but the teacher's like, fine, now show your work. And you're like, oh my God. And like, sometimes you can't, you literally can't, you don't know how to, but your brain got it right. Mm. And it's the same difference there. You're talking about vector math versus symbolic logic. And this is the first time that we've been using the actual mathematical way that our brains work to generate output. It's a completely different beast. When I say the first time, to be fair, I mean, the first uh, artificial perceptron was created in, I think, 1958. But this is the last few years are the beginning of humans actually getting useful work out of AI. And the reason we call this AI and we didn't call the old expert systems AI much is the old expert systems were symbolic logic. And, you know, it was just a decision tree It was if then stuff. And there's just only so far you can go with that. It's great in that it's completely predictable and it's logical. And if it gets it wrong, you can dissect it and figure out exactly why and correct it. But it's a problem in that it requires a lot more code to get the answers you're looking for out of symbolic logic. And also it takes a lot more developer time to actually show your work on the blackboard and, you know, all the steps, get it all, you know, formally written out there versus train a model on a data set. <laughs> it, it, it's a lot quicker. It's cheaper. And uh, guess what our society likes? 
Yeah, well, it turns out when the self-driving car runs somebody over, it might be nice to be able to say, here's the spot where I made that decision. The first point of all of this is, like Jim was saying, is the training phase. And as with everything, garbage in, garbage out. If we train it on data that is slanted or missing or misleading or has an opinion in the training data, then the AI is going to share that opinion. And so if we expect the AI to be neutral, we have to do a better job of constructing the training sets. And there's a whole class of the kind of morality and the ethics that go into how we train these bots that are going to make these decisions. And philosophically, we have to think about what decisions we decide to hand over to these machine learning algorithms, whether that's driving a car or an insurance company using it to decide which patients to treat and which ones not to, or which claims to accept and deny and so on. And it just very quickly gets to a point where, well, it's not our fault. The computer decided that. And it's like, yeah, but who taught the computer what, how to make these decisions? Oh, it was you. So actually it is your fault. And, you know, we don't have any concept of the liability when a computer makes these decisions at this point. And it seems like a bunch of stuff we're going to have to figure out in a hurry. And that's going to lead to possibly some really badly written regulations and laws or, you know, stuff that doesn't show up in time. And it's a bit worrying to me. So this year, we've seen some pretty major changes on the social media front. We've seen Facebook start to decline for the first time. And we've seen Zuckerberg completely take his eye off the ball and just go all in on his shitty metaverse idea that I just, I don't even know what he's doing there. It looks like a game from 20 years ago or 15 years ago or something. But we've also seen Musk buy Twitter and that just go to shit seemingly and the rise of Mastodon at least in some circles and of course we've seen TikTok really having a huge influence over pretty much all other social media everyone's doing short vertical videos now on their platform as I said it feels like this year there's been a lot of changes in that space I don't know social media has always been kind of fast moving I remember when nobody had heard of Twitter <laughs> I remember being super mad at MySpace Tom because when I created my account, he had set himself to be my friend and I found that intrusive and I very indignantly unfriended MySpace Tom. <laughs> and, you know, now I look back and I'm like, that is the only guy who got it right. You know, he made a silly little place where you could put the, the world's worst HTML together and advertise your band or tell everybody, you know, your crappy movie preferences or whatever you wanted to use it for. And then he sold it, made his money, and he just fucked right off. We haven't heard from him again. Like, that's the goat right there. You know, it, yeah. name another social media guy who did it better. I dare you. Yeah. He just travels the world now, just doing whatever he wants. He's just retired and just having a living the life of Riley. I'm sorry, Tom. Turns out I did want to be your friend after all. Yeah. He was probably a cool dude to hang out with. Probably still is. Had to have been. I was there for it, but I never had one. What was the advantage of a MySpace over a GeoCities? <laughs> it was genuinely way, way easier to, to right. set up your little your little page. Yeah, it, it had a WYSIWYG editor, basically. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what it boiled down to. Uh, literally anybody could do MySpace, whereas I knew lots of people who couldn't figure out GeoCities or AngelFire or, or what have you. Yeah, you had to you know actually make the pages yourself and figure out how to FTP them up and, and so on. It was... A lot different. Yeah, and they, they didn't have the built-in like connection aspect. Like you weren't just automatically connected to, you know, your your friends right. GeoCities or it Angel Fire or what have you. <laughs> yeah. MySpace was was uh the the first thing that I encountered anyway that you know let you build like a network of friends where you just say like, Oh, this person is my friend, you know, I want them linked from my thing and the the platform would put it all together for you. Yeah, actually the only interaction I had with MySpace was actually building a bot that would figure out the social network of a person, like look at them and find out who's the friend of a friend of them and build the, the web of him, which was done with just a, a relatively dumb scraper. Well, what was genius about MySpace was that you could have it totally just vanilla if you wanted to and use it just like Facebook or whatever it is now, or you could totally customize it and anything in between. You could just change the background color if you wanted, or you could just totally change all the CSS and everything. And really, I think the downfall of MySpace was 
limiting the number of photos that you could upload. I think that if they had made that unlimited much sooner, Facebook may not have gained such dominance so quickly. Right, but MySpace was trying to be a social network and it, they didn't understand that people were going to use it as their lifetime photo repository. I don't actually think that was what brought MySpace down. I remember that era very well, thank you. And um, all the customization aspects of MySpace were very much a double-edged sword. Yeah, true. You could make it look like whatever you wanted it to, but if you didn't know what the hell you were doing, that meant that you could very quickly create just a horrible mess of like blinking pink comic sans and, you know, every HTML monstrosity known to man. So that part was fairly obvious to me. Like I saw that as, as an obvious negative because, you know, so many people's MySpaces were just completely eyeball vomit. Like you can't get away fast enough. And at the time, I thought that was a big negative. And a lot of the users also thought that was a big negative. One of the big perks to, to Facebook is you could be a complete idiot and your Facebook page would still make you look like a reasonably intelligent human being. Mm. Whereas with MySpace, it was very easy to make it obvious to everybody you didn't know what the crap you were doing. What I miss now, at the time, I thought that was a better thing about Facebook myself because I was tired of looking at, you know, all the, the vomitous MySpace customization. Now, many, 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 many years later, I, I almost wistfully recall how many people's MySpace pages looked absolutely horrible because it was just this immediate visual indication of who somebody was or was not. Like, okay, that may or may not be a, a cool person in real life, but like online, no. <laughs> So MySpace aside, <laughs> yes, sorry, we got bogged down there. What's going to happen over the next year or two? Like, is Twitter just going to decline? Is Elon going to pull it off somehow? Is he going to make his forty-four billion back? He is absolutely not going to pull that off and make his forty-four billion back. Also, a good chunk of that forty-four billion is not his. There's a bunch of banks and so on that bankrolled it, and they're the ones that are going to be left holding the bag. We weren't talking about whether he would get to keep it or not, just whether he would make it back yeah. for the people it belongs to. And again, to be fair, a lot of that money, an awful lot of that money belonged to him. And to the best of my knowledge, he's probably still on the hook for a lot of it that was not technically his. And we don't know all of the working arrangements. And I have a sneaking suspicion in several cases, there probably really weren't very formal working arrangements because we've seen, you know, SMS text records between, you know, Musk and some of the other billionaires that pitched in, and I've said this before, I'll say it again, it looked like a bunch of, you know, stone 20-somethings negotiating a, you know, you fly, I buy, run to Taco Bell at 3 a.m. <laughs> so yeah. I think in a lot of cases, there may not really be <laughs> true arrangements there. And I got to tell you, I absolutely love the idea that at some point, Peter Thiel and Elon Musk getting a fist fight over who's owed what money in the Twitter debacle. <laughs> yes, please. But seriously, though, do you think we're going to see like regulatory issues? Absolutely. Definitely. He already took Ukraine's country code out of the, the two-factor authentication, you know, lookup table. Like Ukrainian users with 2FA on can't log in because Twitter just decided that their country doesn't exist. It's not like that's the only problem. It's just that's like a really obvious glaring one to point out that like this guy, A, doesn't know what he's doing in, in that sense of things. And B, just doesn't give a crap. He is just doing whatever random crap he feels like doing whenever he feels like doing it. And yeah, it's going to it's going to bite him. It's not going to take that long. Yeah, the saying is that the, the wheels of justice, you know, grind slow, but uh, but they're inescapable. So this is not something that like. Next week, you know, Elon's not going to get hauled in front of the EU or whatever in person. But the longer these shenanigans go on, the worse it's going to get. And at this point, I'm really not sure that he's got enough self-awareness or is enough of a grown-up to think about long-term consequences. What about Facebook then? Because two of the biggest Facebook users that I know or sadly knew at this point are no longer with us. And it feels like their user base is literally dying off at this point. And I ask my 17-year-old niece, what do you think of Facebook? And that's just laughter is, is all I get back from her on that. So the metaverse is clearly going nowhere. Facebook, is that just going to slowly decline 
I think like all social networks, they eventually slowly decline. Like MySpace didn't kind of just wink out all at once. And the interesting thing is that what will be the next one is never clear because it kind of depends on this critical mass. Mm -hmm. No one's quite sure the magic that makes that happen. I remember when Twitter was still small and it wasn't clear they were ever going to go anywhere. I guess the real question is, have any of these social networks ever peaked? And when they've gone down, has any one of them ever managed to go back up a second time? No, but is Facebook big enough to go into a steady state? Clearly not. It it has not been picking up newer generations for a very long time now. The momentum that really put it where it is, it grabbed all that momentum by worming its way into the brains of college kids all across the United States. Facebook was a really big thing in the undergrad set during the time period, and this went on for years, where you literally could not be on Facebook if you didn't have an email address that ended in .edu, Mm -hmm. you know, from one of the big universities. That's when it really got its hooks in, and that's why it's declining so badly now, is those people who were in university low those decades ago, they're getting older. And those people, now don't get me wrong, it's not like those are the only people on Facebook, but those people brought their friends with them. And unless you can convince all of these aging Facebook users to both make more 20-something friends and haul them onto Facebook with them, yeah, it's going to decline. Because any rational person who has no connection to Facebook right now and is just asked like, hey, would you like a Facebook account? Who the fuck says yes to that? Okay, this episode is sponsored by Linode. Go to linode.com slash 25A, support the show, and get $100 free credit. From their award-winning support, offered 24-7, 365 to every level of user, to ease of use and setup, it's clear why developers have been trusting Linode for projects both big and small since 2003. Deploy your entire application stack with Linode's one-click app marketplace, or build it all from scratch and manage everything yourself with supported centralized tools like Terraform. And check out their managed MySQL, Postgres, and MongoDB databases that allow you to quickly deploy a new database and defer management tasks like configuration, managing high availability, disaster recovery, backups, and data replication. Simple and fast to deploy with secure access, their flexible plans include daily backups. So go to leno.com slash 25A, create a free account, and you get $100 in credit and support the show. That's leno.com slash 25A. Okay, well, instead of doing free consulting on this episode, I thought we'd do a ZFS FAQ. But first of all, just thank you, everyone who supports us with PayPal and Patreon. We really, really do appreciate that. You really help the show stay on the road, as it were. If you want to learn more about that, you can go to 2.5admins.com slash support. And if you want to send any feedback or normally your questions for Jim and Alan, you can email show at 2.5admins.com. So here was the challenge that I set Jim and Alan. What are the questions about ZFS that you perceive to be frequently asked by people? And keep in mind, if you go too long on this, I'll just edit them out. So keep it brief. What are the uh, questions? You've written a list here. Is one disk okay? Now, we did cover this on episode 121, so you can reference that for a longer version. In brief, yes, it's okay to have ZFS on a single disk. It won't be able to repair errors. It will still be able to detect them. It may be a pain in the butt if you get some corruption and have to restore from backup, but when is restoring from backup not a pain? Yes, it's okay. It's going to be at least as good as any other file system, almost certainly better. So yes, you still get all the advantages even if you miss out on some of the features. Okay. Is non-ECC RAM okay to use with ZFS? The short answer is yes, non-ECC RAM is perfectly fine. ECC RAM is a nice thing to have whether you're using ZFS or not. It is not a deal breaker whether you're using CFS or not. Basically, ECC is better, but if you're on a laptop or something and you can't have ECC, there's no reason to give up ZFS. It's still going to provide more protection than other file systems, probably even better than you know other file systems with ECC, because ZFS will actually know when there's a problem and other file systems don't. Okay, do I need a slog? Depends on your workload. If it's a database or anything that does a lot of synchronous writes, then it can improve things. If you're using it as a file server, you're never going to use the slog and it was a waste of money. The other thing that I'll mention that's a common use case, NFS exports are typically sync always by default. And if you're doing NFS exports in sync mode, yes, a slog will absolutely help your performance. Okay, do I need L2 Arc? 
Probably not. Uh, it's really only meant for the case where you can't have more RAM, because more RAM was always going to be better. And as Jim likes to say, the L2 arc is a, a circular cache. It's not actually an arc, so it's it's not that good. Yeah, what makes the arc great is the fact that uh, it, it, I like to call it a weighted cache. Things that are accessed a lot out of the arc won't drop out of the arc because it keeps bumping them back up to the top because you ask for them all the time. L2 arc does not work that way. L2 arc is just a plain old ring buffer, and the first thing in is the first thing out. So you do not get the hit rates that you're expecting, especially because it's behind the proper arc to begin with. The arc is already going to end up servicing almost all of your cache hits. There's just not a lot left for the L2 arc to pick up. Okay, can I use the same SSD for L2 arc and slog? The answer here is absolutely not. I mean, yes, technically you can do it, but it's always a terrible idea because the entire point of the, the log vita of the slog is to decrease latency when you're doing sync writes. And if you're constantly servicing, you know, weird read requests and writes, because you have to write to the L2 arc constantly as well, then that's going to do very unpredictable things to your latency, especially if you're using consumer SSDs and not enterprise SSDs with hardware QoS, which pretty much everybody asking that question is asking about consumer SSDs. For sure. And in general, your slog, you want really high endurance disk, and it'd be a shame to waste that for L2 arc. Okay, how much RAM do I really need? Now, let me answer this one. Oh, boy. Four gigabytes is all I need in my current NAS, and that's running a couple of pools, and it's fine for basic ZFS. Technically, you probably don't even need that much. Just the more you have, the faster it's going to be. And if you want it to not be slow, more is better. More is definitely better. Uh, I would recommend a minimum of four gigs. Beyond that, more RAM just it buys you more arc is what it buys you. So you have to mm -hmm. hit the actual metal less frequently so things go faster. But is it a hard and fast requirement? Absolutely not. Back in the day when hardware was wimpier, I had a fleet of uh, close to 100 machines running ZFS when the whole machine only had one gig of RAM. Hmm. Yeah, but one caveat I would put to that, don't let this stop you from running ZFS on a one gig Linode. Okay. Is ZFS good for my old slow CPU? I think the answer that really strikes to the, the reason for that question is ZFS is not really particularly CPU hungry. Your system is not going to be a whole lot busier in terms of CPU on the ZFS than the same system doing the same workload on EXT4 would have been. Yes, there's a little bit of work involved in checksum calculation, but it is not a big deal. Yeah, basically anything that's 64-bit will be fine. 32-bit is problematic mostly just because of the memory space you need, the virtual memory space, but that's for another time. And that includes ARM CPUs like Indeed. Raspberry Pi 4, for example. Put it to you this way, I was running ZFS on cheap consumer hardware in 2008 when it first made its way into FreeBSD 7.0 release. If I could run it on 2008-era hardware that wasn't even particularly hot hardware for that time, what CPUs are you going to find, realistically, that are too slow for ZFS? Indeed. Okay, is ZFS on USB drives okay? As much as any file system on USB drives is okay, yes it is. <laughs> With that said, uh, you, you never should expect a ton of reliability from any USB drive. You have issues with the connection itself, you have issues with the power supplied to the drive. Basically, the best way to use ZFS on USB drives is plug it in, import the pool, do your thing, export the pool, unplug it. I do not recommend 24-7 operation over USB. Yeah, and that's the main problem with something like a Raspberry Pi for, for ZFS is that you need a good disk and a way to connect the disk to the machine that isn't USB. If you want low-power, cheap ARM that's a good bet for uh, ZFS, look at the Odroid H2 and uh, Silmer machines. Basically, you want real hardware SATA ports. Can I use it on SMR drives? The answer is yes, you can, and I have, but I don't recommend it. <laughs> Yeah, basically, uh, if you don't need or expect much in the way of performance and you're okay, especially with things like, you know, a resilver if a drive fails and you have to replace it being incredibly slow, if you're okay with all that, then SMR will be fine. It's not going to like eat all your data or anything. It's just going to perform like garbage. The big thing that I would say is don't buy SMR drives. Whether you're using ZFS or not, just don't. They're not actually cheaper and they perform like garbage even when you're not using ZFS. So just don't save the OEM money by buying their SMR crap that they didn't price any cheaper than they priced real drives to begin with. Yeah, it'll work, but avoid it if you can. The other thing I'll mention about that is that that ultimately means 
I don't recommend buying consumer drives like you would stick in a regular desktop machine as a C drive back in the day, you know, like Seagate's Barracuda line. Nah, get NAS drives. They're not really more expensive. They're not, I promise. But whether it's an Iron Wolf or whether it's a WD Red Plus, not WD Red, the NAS drives are really what you ought to be using for this. And they're what you ought to be using anyway. Again, just don't buy SMR. The NAS drives are designed for NAS, and that's what ZFS is basically. They're definitely worth it. Right, well, we better get out of here then. Remember, show at 2.5admins.com if you want to send in your questions or feedback. You can find me on Twitter at Joe Ressington. I'm at JRSSNet and Mary ZFSmas, everyone. And I'm at Alan Jude. We'll see you next year.